and welcome to the Dr. Bob Show. We're going to be spending most of this show talking about superbugs. These are bacteria that are developing resistance to our treatment. All the treatment that we have may not be able to kill these bacteria. So when you and I get sick and the doctor writes for an antibiotic, maybe it won't work. Why does that happen and what can we do to prevent this in our society? My guest is Dr. Mark Rasnick. Dr. Rasnick is a board certified internal medicine specialist and a board certified infectious disease specialist. He'll be answering our questions. Hello, I'm Dr. Robert Overholt. I'll be your host for the next 30 minutes on the Dr. Bob Show. Later on, we'll be talking about what happens inside the heart during a heart attack. Why do people die with a heart attack? And what are some causes of hoarseness uh, could it be simple overuse or could it be cancer? We're talking with Dr. Mark Rasnick, board certified in infectious disease. We're going to be talking about the development of super bacteria, super bugs, resistant bacteria. Mark, welcome to the Dr. Bob Show. Thanks, Dr. Bob. Good Tell night. me about a common cold. If somebody doesn't feel good and they got a runny nose and they ache and they got a little fever, um, I want an antibiotic. What's the problem with that? Sure. Uh, the problem with that is that you could be creating big problems for yourself down the road, and if we do that as a matter of routine in healthcare, we can create big problems for society. So why would it cause a problem? I had a cold, it was an infection, didn't the antibiotic work for that kind of infection? Unfortunately not. Most people that have bronchitis or the common cold, or even most people with sinus infections, sinusitis, actually are infected with a virus, and an antibiotic just will not do anything to kill a virus. So where does it harm the person then? If we treat with an antibiotic and it's a viral infection and antibiotics don't hit viruses, how does it harm people? In the simplest sense, it can cause a bad side effect. There are different things you can get like rashes or inflammation and irritation of certain organs. Those are concerns, but the bigger deal that we see over time is that the bacteria that live on and around your body, when they get exposed to this antibiotic, they can slowly start to mutate and slowly start to develop resistance. And over time, when you do develop a bacterial infection, it's likely that it's going to be with something resistant to common antibiotics, especially if you've taken some antibiotics recently. So if I've taken antibiotics a year ago or two years ago, could the resistant bacteria be living in my body and ready to attack if I keep on treating with antibiotics? Eventually, if you're not on antibiotics for a year or so, your body's bacteria go back to normal, mm -hmm. friendly, harmless bacteria. But the effect on your body can last up to a year, perhaps two years. So how does the doctor know whether to treat with an antibiotic or not? If somebody has fever and chills and don't feel good and they've got an infection and, uh, well, uh, drink a lot of water and have some orange juice, get some sleep and some rest and you'll be better tomorrow, Sometimes that doesn't hit the right tune with a patient. It doesn't always, and patients come to their physician expecting to have something provided to them that will help them feel better. And we as physicians want to help our patients. We want to provide something that will help. So the patients come there with an expectation that we're going to do something to try to improve their condition. And just saying go home and have some chicken soup and a Sprite, sometimes that's not a satisfactory explanation. So you have to spend a lot of time teaching the patient the harm of giving an antibiotic? Or is it easier to give a Z-Pak or? You do, it, education and to explain to a patient's satisfaction that what you're doing is the right thing may take 10, 15 minutes of discussion. Whereas it takes a few clicks of the keystroke to send off a Z-Pak prescription to the local pharmacy. And um, sometimes the path of least resistance for a busy physician especially this time of year when it's flu season and there's a lot of respiratory viruses around. Sometimes the path of least resistance is taken. And sometimes that could be the worst thing that we as physicians 
could do is to take that position. So let's talk about what bacteria become more resistant or what kind of bacteria are living that become resistant. Um, let's, talk, let's talk about MRSA. What yes. does MRSA mean? MRSA is basically named after its antibiotic resistance. It's called methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, MRSA. And it specifically refers to the fact that it is resistant to the most effective antibiotic that we can treat it with, and that's very unfortunate. So when somebody initially had a staph infection, maybe a boil, a skin infection, a chest infection, we used to treat with some simple penicillins and then some more sophisticated penicillins. And then what happened? What did the staph bug do? A staph adapted. It only took it six months to a year after penicillin hit the market in the 40s before resistant strains started to emerge. Wow. And so we developed countermeasures. Medicines like methicillin, nafcillin, oxacillin were all developed to still have activity against staph aureus. But staph aureus is a very versatile and adaptable organism. And so it rapidly developed resistance to those as well. And so in the 70s and 80s, we had to start shifting to a much more toxic and much less effective antibiotic called vancomycin. And it's still the uh, linchpin of Staph aureus treatment to this day. So if somebody has MRSA, that's methicillin resistant yes. Staph aureus. So methicillin used to be the antibiotic that right. worked really good and it would really right. knock out Staph and then the Staph got stronger than the methicillin. It did. The problems with vancomycin? The problem with vancomycin is unlike the others, uh, methicillin, nafcillin, oxacillin, vancomycin can damage your kidneys and I see quite a bit of people develop kidney failure when they're treated with long courses of vancomycin and it's not as effective. It doesn't get penetration into the tissues that are infected as well as the others. It doesn't get into lungs well, doesn't get into the central nervous system well for things like meningitis and uh, it's just not as good, it's not as effective. Why did people, why did staff do such a good job becoming resistant. What's the key to resistant bacteria? Key to resistant bacteria is its ability to form a protein that's resistant to the antibiotic that doesn't cause the bacteria to no longer function and no longer be infectious. There are some bacteria that despite being exposed to antibiotics for decades, like strep, uh, the group A strep that causes sore throat, penicillin's been around for 70 years and it has not managed to defeat penicillin. Staph aureus is a different organism. It has a much larger set of genes. It has a much larger ability to mutate and develop those resistance mechanisms. And group A strep just hasn't been able to do that. And that's a good thing. Are there other bacteria that you see in your infectious disease practice uh, at the hospital? Are we seeing more and more bacteria becoming resistant? We are, and unfortunately the resistance is developing faster than our ability to see new drugs come on the market to counteract that resistance. One of the major concerns for me in a hospitalized patient population are bacteria called gram-negative rods. And these typically will afflict patients with cancer or suppressed immune systems. who have very long stays in an intensive care unit, and some of these things are becoming essentially untreatable now. That means the patient dies. That means the patient dies or fortunately in some cases their own immune system is able to rally enough to fight off the infection, but their survival is very poor compared to if we had a treatable bacteria. If we get a patient in the hospital and they've got a bad lung infection and you grow out some gram-negative rods that you were talking about and staph and they've got other infections in the body and you treat them successfully, are some of those bacteria left in the rooms? What do we do to keep our hospital rooms, our surgical suites, yeah. free of bacteria? So after anyone has had a um, significant infection, uh, their room is, uh, undergoes what's called terminal cleaning. And essentially the housekeepers go in and spend a significant amount of time with bleach and other hospital grade disinfectants, making sure that any surface that is contacted by the patient or anything in the environment that can be contaminated gets adequately cleaned. And who checks on the hospitals to make sure that their infection rate is low? Because that's really right. what the patient's interested in. And so a lot of this information is now publicly reportable. Uh, we are required to report infection rates for a variety of different things to the state of Tennessee. 
uh, Medicare monitors hospitals infection rates and actually penalizes hospitals that are underperforming on certain infection rates. And so there's a lot of disclosure uh, about these rates that are uh, available through a variety of sources. How are the hospitals in East Tennessee and this area doing in general on in infections? Pretty good? In general, pretty good. Uh, we have made some tremendous strides recently by controlling certain things called healthcare acquired infections or HAIs they're called. Uh, things like infections associated with central venous lines that our patients will often have, or ventilator-associated pneumonias. And we've made a lot of strides getting these infection rates down to essentially zero in certain circumstances. Mark, what is C. diff? Is that a common thing? Unfortunately, yes. And that's what we're going to be talking about. C. diff, what's that? And unfortunately, it's very common, common enough for 15,000 deaths every year. We're talking with Dr. Mark Rasnick, board certified in infectious disease, and we've been talking about overuse of antibiotics, allowing bacteria to change their coating to where they become resistant to the bacteria, and it's becoming a more and more common and more severe problem. And we mentioned the word C. diff. Mark, what is C. diff? C. diff stands for Clostridium difficile. A Clostridium, that's a bacteria. It is a bacteria, and it is a kind of bacteria that kind of is ubiquitous in the environment. Clostridia are, they're in the soil, they're in decaying matter. This particular one, though, um, can basically take over the human intestinal tract after other normal bacteria have been killed, produce uh, some very lethal, potentially lethal toxins, and cause some severe illness. So there are normal bacteria in our GI tract? There are more bacterial cells in your body than there are human cells. It's amazing. I've heard it's in the trillions. The, trillions. Uh, which is unbelievable. So we kill some of those good ones that are keeping the C. diff from growing? Yes. And they are basically taking up all the living space and all of the potential food for C. diff until we take an antibiotic. And then it just opens up all this living space that C. diff can move in and take over. Are there certain antibiotics that seem to predispose somebody to get C. diff? There are. Uh, one of the uh, antibiotics that we don't use much anymore, like clindamycin, uh -huh. is notorious for triggering C. diff. And then when you're in the hospital, uh, some of our potent antibiotics for treating resistance infect resistant infections with other things, like cephalosporins, also trigger high rates of C. diff because cephalosporins are blunt weapons. They don't just kill the bacteria we want to kill. They kill most of the bacteria that are in your body and it just leaves your body vulnerable. We use cephalosporins for non-hospitalized patients too, people that have sinus infections, right. chest infections. Uh, they're becoming more sophisticated. There was the Keflex and then Ceftin and then Omnicept, just a little bit more. Can those produce C, C. diff? Any antibiotic can produce C. diff and cephalosporins, the more advanced they become, the more likely they are to produce C. diff. What are the symptoms of C. diff? C. diff can range from just diarrhea, just persistent diarrhea that occurs after you take antibiotics. But in severe cases, it can cause severe abdominal distension, high fevers, and even perforation or rupture of the intestines. And that can be deadly. We used to, is it still called pseudomembranous enterocolitis? Is that same diagnosis? It's the same diagnosis, yes. So it's a bigger, longer name, but bigger, it's longer just C. diff that's causing a, a deadly problem. Once a person gets C. diff, is, how do you get rid of it? It's, by the name uh, would imply difficile. It is very difficult to eradicate this bacteria once you have it. And uh, very recently I've treated patients that had three, four, even five relapses of the C. difficile bacteria. It doesn't respond well to any antibiotic, and with the best antibiotic we have, the relapse rate is still about 20%. Can people catch C. diff out in society? If it's a diarrhea type, then can hand-to-hand -hand contact with somebody unknowingly give you C. diff? Yes, and uh, C. difficile produces what are called spores. And these spores are very tenacious, and things like alcohol-based hand gels will not inactivate them. Uh, just simply washing your hands with water will not inactivate them. You need soap, water, and about a 30-second scrub to sufficiently remove these from your skin to not carry them around. It's pretty scary. It is. Um, 
so if a person walks in a hospital or walks into a doctor's office or walks into a movie theater, any one of those places you need to wash your hands a little bit more? Well, any kind of public place where you touch doorknobs or commonly touch surfaces, good old fashioned soap and water hand wash is advisable. Are we getting too sterile? When I walk into uh, stores, I see alcohol swabs, I see hand sanitizers, uh, I see sprays with hand sanitizers, wash your hands, we're right. told to wash our hands, wash our hands, keeps us from, are we getting too overboard? Is that harmful? I think there is some concern that overusing antibacterial soaps and alcohol hand gels in the home environment might have some untoward consequences down the road in the hospital, in the doctor's office, or at home if you're caring for a sick family member or an immunocompromised young infant. Using some extra precautions is very reasonable, but just for everyone in society to load up on antibiotic impregnated soaps or antibacterial soaps, that's probably not the best thing. What other dangerous superbugs are you seeing in the hospital or that somebody in the community should be aware of? The things we're seeing more and more and that trouble me the most uh, in terms of the ability to treat are these gram-negative rods we alluded to earlier. Uh, in particular, some bacteria that uh, are called Pseudomonas and Acinetobacter and Stenotrophomonas, these very big long names. Big long names. But very dangerous bacteria. And they sound appropriately scary and they're very dangerous bacteria. Uh, if you were to require surgery or a lengthy stay in the ICU, and were to become infected with one of these bacteria, there are some strains now that are basically untreatable. Uh, I've taken care of some patients over the last couple of years that when I looked at the report from the microbiology lab, it listed every antibiotic that we had in the pharmacy as resistant. And that's a very discomforting position to be in as a doctor where you have nothing to offer a patient for something as seemingly common as a bacterial infection. We've sort of been babied by having effective antibiotics for so long. Where does immunization uh, come into protecting our society from bacteria that might become resistant? Absolutely. Immunizations basically stop you from getting sick in the first place. And so the infection you don't catch is an infection you don't have to treat. Uh, if you take the influenza vaccine, not only does it protect you from influenza, it protects you from bacterial complications of influenza, like Staph aureus infections that can cause pneumonia after a case of the flu, or Streptococcus pneumonia. Both of these are very emerging antibiotic resistant bacteria that if you don't get them in the first place, uh, then you don't get sick with them. We also have a vaccination for Streptococcus pneumonia, two different forms of it now. And um, these are, you know, reasonably effective vaccines at preventing antibiotic resistant strains of the pneumococcus or streptococcus pneumonia. Now that's a pneumonia shot. Does that mean the pneumonia if you shot. get the pneumonia shot, you're not gonna get pneumonia? Uh, well, I wish it did. Uh, it protects against one of the most common bacteria that cause pneumonia, yeah. but there are dozens of bacteria that can cause pneumonia for which we just don't have vaccines yet. What is your opinion of what we can do in our community or in any community to cut down on bacteria that are resistant? It's going to take a comprehensive approach. It's going to take continued education of physicians and healthcare systems on when not to prescribe. It's going to take some education of the public to let them know that if you go to your physician and they diagnose you with bronchitis, that's a condition that almost never requires antibiotics to treat. And so that we can work together as healthcare workers and the public at large to try to combat this problem. Mark, one ending question. I'm an allergist. I see a lot of people with allergic sinus disease. I see a lot of people that get a sinus infection. I see a lot of people that don't get well with their sinus infection unless we treat with an antibiotic. I can see the pros and the cons of that. If you let a patient wait three weeks, they've suffered for three weeks. How do you treat somebody with an abnormal mucosa that gets a routine viral infection, but you know they're going to get a secondary infection. The best thing you can try to do is give decongestants, topical therapies, supportive medication, try to help that patient with the inflammatory symptoms early on so that the entrapment of bacteria and the damaged mucosa doesn't become a problem. 
and that will sometimes fail. And when you use antibiotics, you need to use the most specifically targeted one for the infection you're treating, treat for as short of a duration as possible, and ensure that your patient takes all of their pills as prescribed. Mark Rasnick, you're a great teacher. We've got a big problem in our society with superbugs. Thank you for coming and teaching us about them and letting us know that we as a society have to solve this problem. It's good to be here. Thank you. Great show. Know that overuse of antibiotics is a huge problem in our society. And now you want to stay tuned. We're going to be talking about what happens inside the heart during a heart attack and common causes of hoarseness. I want to thank Dr. Mark Rasnick. Wonderful discussion on the development of resistant bacteria, a real problem in society that we have to work out. Now for questions from you, the viewer, that I think will be important to your health. Question number one, Dr. Bob, what happens inside the heart during a heart attack? It's a, it's a great question. The heart is a muscle. It needs its nourishment. It gets its nourishment by a blood supply in the coronary arteries. If something happens inside the coronary arteries, then not enough blood supply goes on to the heart muscles and those heart muscles can die. So what goes on inside the coronary arteries? Well, that's where cholesterol comes into the problem. There is the LDL, the bad cholesterol that's in the bloodstream. And we know that that LDL, bad cholesterol, can be deposited inside the coronary artery. So we see yellow plaques that are there. We used to think the plaque just got bigger and bigger and bigger till it closed off the artery. But we know now that where that cholesterol that's been deposited into the coronary artery, which supplies the blood flow to the heart, in the, that cholesterol plaque, if there's an insult there, if there's an inflammation, if there is a cascade from damage there, what can damage that plaque? Cigarette smoking can, some of the uh, material that flows through the bloodstream can actually cause that suddenly to occur. And it's like an airbag inside that vessel. It suddenly completely closes off that blood supply. No blood supply to the heart. What happens then is the heart muscle dies. That's why it's important to get to the emergency room quickly where they can detect the heart attack. They can reestablish that blood flow through um, uh, heart cath and through stents and through uh, balloon angioplastic. So if you're having crushing chest pain, get to the emergency room quickly. Take an aspirin on your way there. Dr. Bob, what are common causes of hoarseness? Well, the vocal cords approximate each other. And if anything makes it where it's not a complete match there, then we'll get hoarseness. Well, so what can do that? Inflammation can, infection can. Uh, preachers' nodules, teachers' nodules, people that use their voice a lot, that yell a lot, that talk a lot, that have to speak loudly a lot. It irritates the vocal cords and they get little nodules that are there. And therefore, the vocal cord doesn't approximate itself. If the vocal cord in itself becomes sluggish or swollen, what can do that? Inactive thyroid, hypothyroidism, one of the most common causes of hoarseness. So an underactive thyroid makes the vocal cords get swollen. They don't approximate well. So what if somebody has cancer? Well, cancer is an overgrowth of tissue. It can occur on the vocal cord. Persistent hoarseness is one of the warning signs that we have for cancer of the larynx. So if you get persistent hoarseness, if it's just not going away, how, what length of time? Four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, talk to your doctor. It's easy to look at the vocal cord to know what's going on. It's done with a little scope. Usually the ear, nose, and throat doctor will do that. The scope goes into the nose and then with optics, we can look down on the vocal cord and it tells the doctor what's going on in that vocal cord. It can be fixed if there's nodules, they can scrape those nodules. If it's cancer, they'll get a biopsy and they'll determine if there's any spread of that, they can treat it with radiation. If we find all of these things early, then treatment is extremely good. Sometimes people that have 
thyroid surgery will get hoarse. There is a nerve behind the thyroid called the recurrent laryngeal nerve. If that is damaged during thyroid surgery, then somebody may be left with hoarseness. If people get a viral infection, inflammation in the back of the throat, they can get hoarseness with that, usually goes away. Medications, some allergy asthma medications, inhaled cortisone can make the muscles weak that supply the vocal cord another cause of hoarseness. There's a differential diagnosis. Your doctor can go over that with you. If you've got persistent hoarseness, it needs to be evaluated. Well, that's all the time that we have for this show. Remember those four things we want to do. Exercise, the most important thing you could do for stress, for high blood pressure, for being overweight, for feeling good, is to exercise on a regular basis. Make it simple, walking, swimming, biking, running, do whatever you want, but be sure you take that time out to exercise. Eight hours of sleep, be sure you're getting seven and a half to eight hours of sleep. You have to go to bed on time. You have to be sure that your bedroom is set for sleep, that there's nothing that keeps you from waking up during the night. If you're having trouble sleeping, talk to your doctor about it. Maybe simple pain in a shoulder that's keeping you from sleeping well. Eating properly, you know, more fruits, more vegetables. Those are the good foods. It's when we eat the fried fatty foods that we have problems. And most of all, what is it we like in the Dr. Bob Show? It's laughter in your life. Laugh a lot, you'll stay healthy.